trying to start. If you guys want to grab the chairs from back there too, if you want to come and put them so you can see the screen better, you can do that. Oh dear, did it knock the tree? Okay, well good evening and uh, welcome members of the public and council members, Councillor Cummings and Councillor Iacobellis uh, to this community meeting to discuss the Lackawanna Plaza redevelopment plan traffic impact study. Um, the purpose of this meeting is really to uh, explain to the public and the council uh, the results of the analysis that was done, how the analysis was, what was done uh, to ev evaluate the traffic conditions and traffic impact created by redevelopment around uh, or on, on the Lackawanna Plaza property. It's really focusing on what the impact will be from the traffic that's generated from the development that's anticipated in the redevelopment plan on the surrounding streets and intersections. So we have uh, Joe Fishinger from Brightview Engineering who uh, completed the study and will give uh, a summary, an executive summary of how it was conducted and what the results are and what his recommendations are. Uh, we want to try and keep it relatively short. Um, we don't want to go through every single detail. I want to leave enough time for questions from council members and from members of the public uh, about the results. We do have a hard stop at seven o'clock because there's another meeting in, in, in this room this evening. If anybody has any questions that aren't um, answered this evening or if members of the public who couldn't make it this evening do have questions, feel free to contact me and uh, we will look into uh, providing you answers. So I'd like to introduce Joe Fischinger. Go ahead. Thanks, Janice. Oops. Hopefully, uh, if I get too far from the mic, please just stop me and uh, say something. But um, I'm going to go through a lot, some of this stuff fairly quickly because I don't want to get too bogged down in a lot of the technical details and kind of get more towards the solutions but I do want to walk you through the steps we took to do this study and how how the study was prepared why the study was prepared um, as Janice mentioned the real test for this study is to figure out what improvements would be necessary or what impacts there are with the redevelopment plan we're not finding solutions for every existing problem in town that's a whole nother study that you know, could be a career for someone to fix every little issue in town. But this is to look at the conditions without the redevelopment plan and with the redevelopment plan and figure out what improvements may need to be necessary. So what I'll do is we'll go over the study area, sort of existing conditions first, how we establish that. Our no build, because we take a projection into the future, of what we think traffic will be like without the, the redevelopment plan. Talk about what the redevelopment plan itself and how we got the, the volumes associated with it. Then our full build conditions once we add the volumes from the redevelopment plan onto the, to our models. And then mitigation as to where we found problems and our recommendations to fix them. So the study area is roughly 15 intersections. It encompasses sections of Bloomfield Avenue, uh, Glenridge Avenue, G Grove Street. Uh, the primary corridors are Bloomfield Avenue, Glenridge, and Grove with a few other intersections along the way. Uh, the, the intersections are those big orange dots. I apologize if it's a little blurry on this projector to see. So the way we started is we 
collected existing traffic volumes. And the way that's done is we put out small digital cameras. The photo in the, in the bottom in the center is actually a picture of one of the cameras. They're small um, digital cameras that get strapped to utility poles or light poles. And they give us a sort of a bird's eye view of the intersection. As you can see, this is Bloomfield and Grove in the lower right. And what happens is we recorded video on Thursday, January 5th. We looked at 7 to 9 in the morning and 2 to 6 in the evening. And then Saturday the 7th from 10 to 2 to try and get our existing volumes. And what happens is we take that video for each intersection on some of the larger intersections like Bloomfield and Grove. We actually had two cameras. So if you can see, you can't really see all of the crosswalk in that particular picture. We had a second camera on the other side of the intersection to capture that. And we send that out for processing. There's a dedicated processing companies that have computer algorithms that watch the uh, process the video and tell us not only the cars, trucks, buses, and which way they turn, but also how many pedestrians are in the crosswalks, bicycles in the crosswalks, so that we get an, an idea of what the existing volumes are. And then we take that, those, that data for the entire network, look at the intersections between each other, make sure that they make sense between intersections, and compile our system-wide peak hours. Say, okay, well, the busiest time is 745 to 845 in the morning, 5 to 6 in the evening, and between 1 and 2 on Saturday. And that gives us those, the types of turning movements that you see in the upper center, which are depicted as AM, PM, and then Saturday. And that tells us how many cars are making each individual movement at every intersection at each of those peak hours. So those are the turning movements. That is actually at Bloomfield and Grove. So if you see 57, the what is the would be the westbound left turn, the 57, 48, 52. That means 57 cars made that turn in the morning peak hour, 48 made it in the evening peak hour, and 52 on the Saturday peak hour. No. The, this, this picture is total volume. We do have separate numbers for trucks and buses. That was counted separately and is accounted for in the analysis. But as you can imagine, the, the number of the, the volume of data points can get, gets pretty big pretty quickly. So what we then do is we take that data compi combined with the geometric data for each intersection the number of lanes, the width of the lanes, whether or not you're allowed to make right turns on red, uh, combined with the traffic signal timings of how the signal operates, we were able to get that information from the county in most cases where they provided us information from the signal controllers so we know the parameters that the signal's operating on there. And we feed that all into a program called Synchro, which is, does a lot of the number crunching and math for us. And what that spits out is it tells us an average delay for each movement at the intersection. Now that's one of the key things to remember is that's an average. So if you pull up and you have a green, you see the green light, you may not experience that much delay, but you know, a car 10 behind you that gets stuck at the red light may have a higher delay. And this is the average of all the vehicles that go through once you take into account the geometry, the signal timing and the amount of cars going through. So what we, what's been, as traffic engineers have established is the level of service criteria, A through F, similar to a grading system. And based on the amount of delay that that experiences, we assign it a, a letter grade A through F. For signalized intersections, that F threshold where we consider something failing is 80 seconds. Once you get past that 80-second range, that's where we start seeing a breakdown of the system. Cars can't get through the intersection. People start making um, poorer choices in judgment. Maybe they run the light. Maybe they'll, they'll accept gaps that they wouldn't normally. And at unsignalized or stop sign intersections, it's a similar system except the, that F threshold is 50 seconds. That, 
We found though, studies over time have shown, pretty much have shown that after that 50 seconds, people start to get impatient and will try to turn in shorter and shorter gaps. So that's the sort of the threshold we've set up for failure. Typically in most intersections, most conditions peak hour you're seeing, C and D range is your normal peak hour operating conditions. Once we get into the E's and F range, that's where we know we're starting to have problems. So once how long is the presentation? Let's let's start with that. Um, I should be able to get through it in like ten or fifteen minutes. It should oh, take that long. I would if you need a clarifying question throughout. I would say we can stop for a clarifying question about what you're looking at. I think that's fair, and then save all the other questions for the end. So jumping forward a little to the results of our existing analysis, and this is the 2023 existing conditions. This is just the volumes we've counted out on the road as in, in January with the timings and the configurations that's in there now. And these charts are color coded with green being the A's and B's, yellow is a C, and then orange and into red is the D's, E's, and F. So pretty much when you start to see the orange, that's where we're getting to almost the limit of acceptable, so to speak. And once there starts to be E's and F's in the red, then we know we have failing conditions, just to try and make it a little easier to see what's going on. And I don't, I'm not going to go through each individual movement at each intersection, but as I flip through these, what you see is the, the primary ones where we start to see issues or we know of issues is the intersections on Bloomfield Avenue and also some of the intersections on, on Claremont and on Glen Ridge. So then that's fine for existing. That tells us what's happening today, but we need to figure out what's going to happen in the future. And this is where we, traffic, as traffic engineers, we put on our prognosticator hat and try and predict what's going to happen on in the future. And the way we come up with these, what we call no-build conditions, is a combination of a few different factors. We look at a background growth rate that we apply to all the volumes in the network, and that's 2% a year compounded for three years. We're assuming 2026 as a construction year. So that comes out to a little over 6% of background traffic growth that's just applied to all the existing volumes. And then on top of that, we add the traffic from developments that we know are coming, stuff that's either come through the planning or zoning board or stuff that is we know is on the books and just not generating traffic, stuff's under construction or is, just hasn't started construction yet. And that gets added on to the development as well. If we had traffic studies from these developments, we referred to them. If we didn't have a specific study, we estimated that traffic ourselves and added on to, the, to our background growth to get our no-build conditions. So, and then we took those numbers, ran them through the analysis software again to get similar levels of service to the existing. And as one would expect, we're just increasing the volumes. Things start to get a little bit worse. We see delays in your D's and E levels of service, again on the Bloomfield Avenue intersections and at Grove and Claremont, that's where we see the majority of the lower, lower levels of service or in higher delays. So now that we, have, we know what traffic's, we expect traffic to look like without the development, we need to figure out how much the development is going to generate. And this was the development plan that we pulled out of the redevelopment plan is a combination of retail space, office, and residential units on both the east and west sides of the site. And since the access points are not very firmly defined, we had to make some assumptions of approximately as to where they are and which movements are available. And then once we have the development, what we do 
is we have to generate trips. We have to figure out how much traffic they're going to generate. And that is used during using the, the ITE trip generation manual, which is a compilation of counts that have been done by various entities over the years. And you know, uh, there may be a site that has a 100 unit residential development. Someone will count it and they'll record that data and that'll get sent into the ITE and reviewed and vetted and ultimately inserted into this manual as a set of statistical charts that say, okay, well, if we have 86 units of apartments, we expect it to generate so many trips. And similar for office uses, retail uses, uh, there's probably about 800 different categories in the manual as you go through, depending on what type of project you're looking at. And that's what this ta the tables on the left side of the screen show is the numbers out of the ITE manual. Now, along with that, we also there's a few caveats that we consider. For example, for retail developments, we also look at a component of these numbers as pass-by trips. That's cars that are already on the road that are just pulling into the site to buy something and leave. If you're stopping to pick up a quart of milk on your way home from work, you pull into the store, you grab your, your milk, and you drive back out. You're, you're already on the road. You're just diverting and going, passing by and stopping to pick something up. Stopping for gas on your way home from work is a classic example of a pass-by trip. You're not going there specifically to get gas. You're just stopping on the way. And those numbers for the retail range between 20 and 40 percent, depending on the size of the and type of development. And we based our pass-by rates on the recommended rates from ITE and the NJDOT. And then once we have these gross numbers, when we have to assign them to the roadway network. They don't all just appear. They have to drive through the network to get to and from the site. And the way we figure that out is it's a series of what we call gravity models. For the residential developments, we base it on census data. For Montclair, in this case, we'll look at people who live in Montclair based on the census data, look at where they work. And then we use, when honestly, now we use Google Maps. We'll say, OK, if we're going, if we set this is our origin and if it says 1% of the traffic, 1% of the people who live in Montclair work in West Caldwell, we'll put West Caldwell as the destination and see what the most logical route is for that traffic. And we do that for each of the various destinations to come up with a routing percentages for the entire development. For the Office space, it's basically the opposite. We look at where people live who work in Montclair. And then for the, re the retail components, it's a combination of population and distance. So the higher an area of population in the area is, the more likely people will shop from that area. But the further that area is away from Montclair, the less likely someone would come to that you're not necessarily going to drive half an hour to go to a grocery store you know, so the distance we the further they're away the less weight they get the more population the more they do so that is all we calculate all of those percentages apply it to the entire network applying with these rates to get our site generated trips and I know you can't see the the numbers on the right but that is the total number of trips and the actual spreadsheet has this broken down for every individual m movement and every individual development throughout the whole network. So then what we do, we not, once we have those site trips, then we simply take the no build volumes that we discussed before, add the site generated trips to them, and that gives us our full build volumes. Then we put that back into the simulation models to get our full build levels of service. Now this is, there's been no changes to the roadway network, no changes to the traffic lights. This is, can that, the roadway, just as it was in the no build, can it handle the additional traffic or not? And what we see is we, pretty much as one would expect, the, everything gets a little bit more delay, a little bit worse, 
and the intersections that were on the borderline or were po operating poorly before are the obvious are the ones that tend to get worse predominantly some of Bloomfield Avenue um, we see Grove and Glen Ridge while everything does increase in delay those are the some of the primary and you can see uh, Glove, Grove and Glen Ridge we have the the most intense increases where the evening peak hour the left turn goes up to a 219 second F which is well beyond the capacity of the intersection so that's <coughs> excuse me that's the intersections that we need to look and see well what can we do to fix that where I'm engineer I like to fix things so we look at what kinds of things we can fix another one that we start to see a lot more delays at is at Grove and Claremont and then the other thing we do look at now that we have traffic associated with the individual driveways to the site is look at how the driveways would operate and we didn't focus on this too much because since the driveways are not there yet they can still be designed and built um, you can see it the building B driveway with Glen Ridge that's our operating at a D level of service that may tell us that we need to put a two lane exit instead of a one lane exit but since we were focusing on more of the what it's going to do to surrounding network and not so much the site driveways we didn't get into the details of how to address those level of service issues so in addition to the level of service analysis we do take a step back and realize that it's not just delay um, a companion program the synchro we use is called sim traffic and what that does is it compiles the the models takes into account the lane geometry the lane widths the signal timing puts the cars on the road and we can actually watch the cars move around through the network and see where the problems are see where things start to back up and one of the things we noticed, this screenshot of the sim traffic model, Wal uh, Grove Street sort of runs from the lower left to the upper right, Walnut is at the top of the screen, and Claremont at the bottom, and we have the Accrade crossing for New Jersey Transit and in between. And we simulated that crossing to put in essentially a dummy traffic light that stops traffic at regular intervals to see what kind of queuing occurs when the train comes through. And one of the things we noticed with that is, at, especially at Grove and Walnut, you get that one car at the front of the queue who wants to make a left turn and can't, and we start seeing significant queuing back over the railroad crossing and over through, through the adjacent intersections. So we want, as we're developing our improvements, we're not only looking at pure delays we're also trying to address these uh, queuing and operational issues at the same time so that leads sort of to the the improvements themselves and I'll go through the concept plans in a second um, but basically as far as Bloomfield Avenue and Grove we're looking to make some modifications on the Elm Street approach um, what we're seeing happening right now is there's a few parking spaces close to the intersection so even though it's striped as two lanes at the light as a left turn lane and a through lane it's not behaving that way because they just can't get to the second lane um, as far as the rest of Bloomfield Avenue there are some timing changes that can be made to help with the not only the amount of green time but also the offsets the communication between lights and that's something that when the county redid the lights on Bloomfield Avenue they put in a connected system and that's a change that they can make fairly easily from their office in Verona it's all programmed into their system and then as far as Grove Street and I said I'll walk through each of these in particular but the common theme is left turn lanes and new traffic lights that the next step for the for Grove Street is we need to try and get the left turning traffic out of the main travel stream so we can keep things moving so with the mitigation in place we don't solve all of the delays there's still delays at Bloomfield and Grove there's still 
delays at Willow. There's still going to be some delays on Grove Street. But we're back to where we started with. We're not at failing levels of service anymore. We've sort of offset the impact of the redevelopment plan with these improvements. So what those improvements look like is this is Bloomfield Avenue and Grove Street slash Elm with Bloomfield running basically up and down on the screen. Um, and as you can see on the Elm Street side, we've eliminated, we eliminate a few parking spots. Um, I believe there's two meters that would need to be removed and restripe the Elm to provide a longer left turn lane. And what we tried to do is a balance that we had to take out those two parking spots, but we tried to preserve as much of the on-street parking as we could and provide a longer left turn slot so that at least those lanes can get utilized appropriately. On the other side of the road, <coughs> on the Grove Street side, we're formalizing the, the lane geometry so that there is a left turn lane and a single through lane. And then, as I mentioned before, adjustments to the timing accordingly. Uh, moving up Grove Street, so now in this figure, Bloomfield Avenue is on the far left. Uh, we, you're looking at the section of Grove between Bloomfield and Glen Ridge. And we have left turn lanes at both signals, and there is an area in the middle where there's no driveways proposed that could be pavement and the left turn lanes could be longer, but it, there's also the potential of an island or some sort of grass area in the middle. There is space for that. This is far from a final design. It's just an initial concept. Um, moving down to the signal at Glenridge and Grove, and in this one we kind of turn the diagram somewhat so that we can get the whole intersection on the screen. So in this case, Grove is going up and down and Glen Ridge is east to west. Um, we're putting in left turn lanes on all four corners of the intersection. We're anticipating because of the amount of work that would need to be done and the widening that would need to be necessary, which is shown in that dark, almost black color, is that's new pavement that would be, have to be added to the road. We would need to replace the traffic signal as well, that in order to do all of this work, we're putting in a, a whole new light at the same time. So the bike lane is actually there as part of it, just on the, we'll call the south side of Glen Ridge. In most of the, that dark black area is the bike lane. Um, we cut our improvements off basically at the property line of the redevelopment plan. And realize that as this moves forward, there are other plans the town has to extend that bike lane further on. So where you have this sort of abrupt turn to get into the bike lane as other sections of the bike lanes are built, that would be carried through. But what we tried to do was hold the curb line on the north side of Glen Ridge against the post office and widen towards the development where they control the property. Where's Tony's Brook in that? Right along the bike lane, right? I'm sorry? Tony's Brook is right underneath the new pavement, is it not? No, it's just Brook. I don't, left yeah, I don't think um, Joe can answer that. You can yeah. see the part of it is in the left-hand corner where the, where the, the dashed lines are, the where the stripes are, yeah. yes. But then, it, right then it, the brook is right there, but then it traverses across yeah. the redevelopment site. It's not along the road. The road. Are you saying the road is parking? This concept keeps the, cro keeps the parking on on Glen Ridge, it stays. Grove, on the other hand, all the parking ends up going. I'll get to that, the, the next figure. So what, and this, we're back sort of to the diagonal. Grove runs from the lower left to the upper right. And what we end up having to do is, in order to provide the left turn lanes, once we look at the amount of distance we need for storage for the left turn lanes, and then look at the amount of space we would need to taper back down to just one lane in each direction. What we're trying, we just don't have enough space to sh shift everybody over and back again. 
because we don't want it sort of an hourglass effect on the road, then where that prohibits all parking on Grove Street. Yes. But there are two additional ones closer to the light. Because we're recording this, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to, whoever wants to speak, I'll give you. Sorry. I can repeat my question. I'm confused. Are you going to hold them or now press the button? All right. Joe, you're, Joe, you're almost finished, so. Yeah, my apologies. All right, so to move on back to said in Grove Street, we end up having to, in order to provide those left turn lanes within the existing pavement, that means eliminating all of the parking along Grove Street. And in that section where we don't have the, we don't need the story, left turn storage for the signals, we've shown it as sort of a two way left turn lane to provide left, uh, a refuge for people to make left turns in and out of their driveways. And then at the signal at Grove and Claremont, we're again providing left turn slots and updates to the traffic signal. Um, we end up having to replace, we end up calling for the replacement of the entire traffic signal. Um, a lot of the signals on Grove Street are fairly dated, so we're anticipating that in order to upgrade them, they would pretty much need to be completely replaced. What ends up typically happening on these is you build the new signal next to the old one, switch over and take the old ones down, similar to what the county had to do on Bloomfield Avenue. And then as we move further up Grove, past the railroad station, again, we have to keep that center turn lane because we can't transition over the railroad tracks. And then we reconfigure Grove and Walnut to provide that left turn lane, not so much as a pure uh, improvement to delay, but to, to minimize and reduce the, the chance of cars queuing up over the railroad tracks to keep them out of, off of the tracks. And that we're also calling for to replace the signal at Grove and Walnut. And that's, that's honestly more just for the age of the equipment, that light there are no signal heads up over the road. They're all just post-mounted lights, which makes them harder to see. So we would be calling for a complete replacement of those, of that traffic light. As a general rule, and we can get into more specific numbers as if anyone wants to, but generally speaking at Grove and Claremont, because of the amount of roadway construction work, we're estimating that to cost around a million dollars and then the, sig the other two signals would be at about half a million dollars each, just to give you an order of magnitude of what it would cost to do that construction. And who would pay for that? So this is actually the last slide other than to let everyone know, either if, especially if they're watching on, on YouTube, that if there are any additional comments to contact Janice directly so that the town can collate all the comments and questions and keep track of anything. Um, to answer your question about who would pay for the construction, that would, would be something that can be written into the, develop the redevelopment plan if it's something the town wants the developer to pay for or if it's something the town wants to take on. Or they could take my recommendations, throw them out the window and come up with something different. Okay. So I know I went through that fairly quickly, but hopefully I hit the highlights. If you could please go back to the slide where you had the parking spots on Claremont in front of the post office. Could you just clarify whether those parking spots in front of the post office are staying as is, and, or are you removing them or some of them? So the parking space, in this concept, the parking spaces on the post office side remain um, on the side? and on the south side we're showing I believe five parking spaces there they will they won't be in the same place because we need to widen the road and they will be shifted over so those parking spaces would be between the travel lane and the bike lane so the parking is still 
in that area, it's best being shifted to accommodate the additional turn the lane. I don't have the number right in front of me, um, but we t we look to maintain the same amount of parking that's out there today. Actually, the question is, what is the net loss of the parking that you all planned? That wasn't the question. But kind of that is what I'm saying. So at this point, since they're not definitively spaced, we didn't count how many parking spaces. That's something we can do, get an estimate as to how many parking spaces this concept does lose. But I don't have that number in front of me. Specify the, uh, from where on the road, how much would grow from where to where you're eliminating parking? From Glen Ridge to Claremont. And then from from Glen Ridge. Glen so, So there would be no parking on Grove Street from Bloomfield Avenue all the way to Walnut. They're already, the, first of all, there already isn't from Bloomfield Avenue to Glen Ridge Avenue. There's already no parking. Right. And that was the larger point I was going to make because it's actually right now unregulated. There's no signage. So even in front of my house on Grove and Claremont. People park, and the, the workers for a lot of the retail stores park there um, because there's no signage at all regulating it. Um, and, and because, by the way, since some of the new businesses opened up, there was a karate place that turned into a, a, a Veda salon and a dentist. The employees now, I know, park there all day long. Right? They just park full day long. And because of that, the tr it used to be a travel lane, and now it's blocked, and it's actually been exacerbating the backups uh, on Grove Street as a result. In front of... Okay, in front of uh, Pass Walnut going north towards Grove Pharmacy and all, how many spaces are being lost there when you come back down from the left-hand turn lane? That hasn't been, that hasn't been done to parking this year. It's being shown there, though. You have a left-hand turn lane going southbound on Grove Street at Walnut. That takes away parking on the northbound side because there's parking in front of the restaurant going towards Grove Pharmacy. Yeah, I don't know the exact number of spaces at that but point. Those but would go in away. order to provide the, and the reason that left turn slot um, going on Grove, going towards Bloomfield Avenue is there, is basically because we need to provide a shadow for the left turn slot on the other side. So it's still, we put the minimum left turn slot we could reasonably put, but yes, that would. There would be park. There wouldn't be parking within that the area of that left turn lane until we could drop it. Okay. So the parking by the funeral parlor is being eliminated. Yeah. That's down by Glen Ridge and Grove. Well, yes. Right by those yeah. post offices. Um, so I think it's so two things that have been killed. A, the current plan, what you see here today, he is. We've asked him to extend because we haven't even gotten to the south part to Elm Street and Elmwood Avenue. Right. So this isn't a complete parking study. It's what we were given up to date. So there, there'll be more work to be done. And, and part of that is also on the impact on Walnut Street, similar to Claremont. So take that in consideration. But it's a very good question about the elimination of parking on Grove Street between, I guess that would be um, after Walnut because those businesses are right there. So now you're talking about limiting traffic there. The, that is the primary, if you're looking at the impacts of this project, that is the primary issue is we need to provide left turn lanes and additional capacity in the form of left turn lanes on Grove. And the, and the, the first cut of how to do that is to claim that what is now parking as a travel lane. Right, but for me, what that says is there's a significant impact. Yeah, and I guess the thing that I would ask, can you go back to the no build 2026? Just, I just wanna look at that data first, because my sense is we actually have to do this anyway, the left turns on Grove. With, without even Lackawanna Plaza, we're already Anybody who's familiar with Grove Street between Walnut and Glen Ridge knows that whenever there's a train, oh, yeah. 
the cars are backed up yeah, already, right? So you, you, I think we already need left turn lanes to be built, regardless if there's a, um, a development at Lackawanna Plaza or not. So okay. what we're you seeing. Just cost us a half million dollars. So what we're seeing in no build is we're getting closer to capacity. It hasn't quite had that tipping point yet to move over to the failing condition. Although, as I pointed out before, when we look at the operational analysis, that queuing, especially at Grove and Walnut, what we're seeing is you get one car waiting to make a left, it's backing up the whole corridor. Now, it's not long enough. There is a left turn arrow, but I don't think. Also, the train, there can be two trains going by that have the gates down for a good 10 minutes, it seems, sometimes. So I don't know if that's included in your simulated light for the railroad crossing. But that 10 minutes can back things up tremendously during rush hour. And we had to make some assumptions as to how long that would it would stop. We looked at, and this is roughly three minutes every 15 minutes, I believe, was the way we coded the model. If, if it's 10 minutes straight, obviously that's going to lead to more congestion. Um, and this is, would be further down the line when these are actually designed. Any new lights would need to be tied into that railroad, uh, into the railroad system so that they're coordinated with the railroad to do more so than anything else to make sure that it's as unlikely as possible that somebody gets stuck on the tracks. Also, has pedestrian crossings as well? Sorry, can you use the microphone so the people watching okay, can then, hear? Then yes, yeah. thank you, I'll take my turn. Thank you, Councilman Cummings, for uh, letting us know that this is not the end because I'm very concerned about what's going on on the Elm Street side and Bloomfield as well. Can you go back to the um, 2026 full build that, that, that shows what's going on at Elm Street and Bloomfield Avenue with full build and where we are and just um, elaborate on it a little bit. We went through pretty quickly. Elm Street side, the side that would be over by Hawthorne and Elmwood and the restaurant in there and the Firestone and uh, all of that. Yes, that's. So those are EBL is eastbound left, EBTR is eastbound through and right. Okay. Since it's one, since there's one lane with, my apologies, um, since there's only one lane that accommodates both movements, we get a combined delay, it's not separated out into through and right if they're, they use a single lane. Guys, I'm sorry, please use the microphone because there are people watching. Well, um, did you elaborate on, on that um, so that sorry. I can understand? I didn't know if we finished a question I asked. It didn't help if we did. I, can you explain so the, that to me? In please? this case, and then it, tell me the, the overall like, grade like we did on the other one. You said, you know, one, the overall grade at one of the sites was an F and um, oh, the, the one at um, Grove Street and Glen Ridge Ave. Yeah. So what would this be? So in this model, we assumed Bloomfield Avenue runs east to west. In reality, it's sort of on a diagonal, but we assumed Bloomfield Avenue was east-west. So the northbound approach is the Elm Street approach approaching Bloomfield Avenue, and that is the left turn is shown as operating at a C in the full build, and I think part of that is just cars can't get to it, but the through and right is at, um, at a 61 second E in the morning and a 59 second E in the evening. So we're just, we're pretty much at capacity. We're getting close to capacity for those movements. And this does not go all the way out to Elmwood where we have another probably F um, location. This, how far out does this go, I guess would be a better question. So this this one here in Dr. Baskerville goes to Union, but okay. the extent, but the, the the next step goes to Hawthorne and Elmwood Avenue, okay. Elmwood Avenue down to Maple and Maple to Bloomfield. Thank you. As well as out to Walnut Street. Thank you. 
Thank you. I just need to understand, going back to that other chart. Um, so just say there, just to understand what this really means. So looking at the first um, EB eastbound left from Grove Claremont Avenue eastbound left, the weekday morning peak hours is rated C, and then it says 32.0. Does that mean someone is waiting 32 seconds to cross? What does that mean? That is the average delay that vehicles will experience making that movement through right. the intersection. 32 seconds. 32 seconds right. on average. And is that the first person who is waiting to, to go across the street, to, to go through? Or if, I, if there's a queue at that intersection and there's 10 cars behind me, I'm obviously waiting a lot more if I'm the last of the 10 cars than I am the first. So the first car waits 32 seconds and then they go through and then there's like a you know, steady flow but I could have been waiting how long in the back? Yeah, right. yeah. how many lights am I waiting? That's and right. That's what is not clear from is, a lot of this. And this, this is the average. If you were the first car to pull up, depending on when you pulled up, maybe the light turns green immediately, maybe you're sitting there and waiting. And then this is, once you look at how many, every car in that queue as they go through, one may take 10 seconds, one may take 40. When they average together, that's where we get the 32 seconds from. We don't know the length of the queue. We can, that we have that information, it's in the reports. I don't have, I didn't provide those tables here, but that is all in our analysis. Can, can I keep going? Or, Go for it. Yeah, can you start at the beginning? Oh, uh, Carmel, no. let Mr. Scott, he's been asking for a while, because I know once you start, and Mr. Cotter, because I, I got, yeah, but I got your list, and we want to make sure everybody gets a chance. Okay. Uh, can you hear? She lives here. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Now, if you go to the build, full build scenario, and then you start, say, for instance, backing out a 30% for the retail, a 30% for the office space, a 30% for the residential. Can you correlate that back to what the possible sizes of the development would be? Because you're, uh, my question is, if you're reducing the flow to get to the facility, whether it's the retail, the office space, or the commercial, you've got less traffic. So can you, can you basically reverse engineer the requirement for all the upgrades at that point? We haven't done that analysis, but that is something we can do. What you're saying is how much could be built on this site before you have to With add at, a left turn lane? At certain percentages of the project. That can be done. There's, as you can imagine, there's a number of different components to the development, so that can get well, you, to be a lot of analysis quickly, yeah. but yes, that is something that can be done, the yeah, back out I, to I how much. When you, when you talked about your full build scenario, then you start, you refer to computer generated information. So you can put information in and you can take information out to, to, to draw that correlation. Yes, it's not all automated. There's, there is some human intervention and steps in between. So it's an iterative process we would have to and, and adjust the numbers to run the model, see where it responds, and adjust accordingly. But it can be done. Okay, and I'll give the mic because at some point in time, you know, you could determine how much it would cost if I did X, Y, or Z with the certain build scenarios. <laughs> Joe, I have a question. Um, does this analysis um, take into effect how drivers? would seek to circumvent these delays, meaning how they will divert to avoid the backups. I mean, I'll just give you a sense of what I'm trying to figure out. As a Clover Hill resident, right, if there's a, ba if there's a backup on Glen Ridge Avenue, the quickest route away from Grove Street is to divert and use the secret squirrel route of Clover Hill. And anybody listening in the public, I don't want you to do that. But, but does, does your analysis take into account that kind of diversion? The short answer is no. Once we set the 
the routing into the site based on what is the most practical route in, that is fixed. The mo it's, this is not a dynamic model where the cars are actively rerouted because uh -huh. we don't, we want to measure what the impact would be on the main roads and so we can fix them. Well, so I, th I think we also want to measure the impact on the secondary and tertiary streets. And so thus, do those models exist where they would be dynamic, meaning car A finds itself five cars back on Glen Ridge Avenue looking to make a right, and it sees Clover Hill. Do, does, the, does, the, does the algorithm have the ability to, to measure that? There are other software programs that can do that that is much more involved from a programming standpoint and a cost standpoint. Um, they're, to be honest, they're typically used on very large projects that, can, that encompass much larger areas. Um, those models are, n are not very real fine-tuned, so the example you're thinking of where there may be 25 cars on the road now and it's increasing to 40, mm -hmm. that we haven't seen much luck when we have used them on numbers that small. But the, the technology is there. It is time intensive and labor intensive. Uh -huh. but, in your, but in your professional experience, logic would dictate if we're backed up on a road, we're going to try to, the cars are going to try to find the fastest route to their destination. Yeah, this is the Waze question. The Waze like, question. What, what, what does Waze decide to tell yeah. cars to do, yeah. right? And let me just add one more thing before you answer that because I know other people have a question. But counselors, the, the other thing that uh, this traffic study doesn't take into account is pedestrian safety and other measures that will increase with volume, right? What Joe has done is tried to find the way that cars can get through these intersections the fastest, where I think part of the goal of the residents who live in the shadow of this will be how can the intersections be made the safest. Does that make sense? Because I, th I think there's a big difference between what Joe was tasked with doing and what the residents will experience uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I, to answer your question, Mr. Cotter, I think that's part of why we're starting here now, yeah. to give you those opportunities, present those questions to us, and then to hear you and adapt how we move forward. Okay, thanks. Or at least so, for, I'm speaking for myself. All right, thank you. So, um, and to let me answer just, your... Can I just add as well, um, mm -hmm. as the town, and, and I, think, I do think that's an important dynamic because as the town moves forward with things like a Vision Zero Task Force and we're working with the county with the goal of slowing traffic, right? I think this is a really good point because you have now these opposing forces and goals. This is what the Bloomfield Avenue project was. The intention was pedestrian safety and what's happened, it slowed all the vehicular traffic down. If Grove Street, if that comes online in terms of you know wanting to have shorter crosswalks, longer times to go across, having bump outs, those things will, will all have an impact on slowing the traffic down for sure. So, and to answer your earlier question, we, what, with the reason we're using that static routing where once they say, okay, everyone's gonna, supposed to come down Grove because that's the most convenient route, we want to keep them on there so we can see what the impact are. If we told the model, okay, if Grove Street's congested, they're going to move over to the next block, well, then the model's not going to show a problem on Grove. It's just going to show the traffic moving. So we want to figure out, okay, well, how much traffic do we expect to be on Grove and want to be on Grove, for example, and provide the infrastructure to accommodate it so that they don't have to, so that it isn't faster than to cut through some of the neighborhood streets. I, okay. um, I, I, just, I just have to say, you <laughs> Um, so could you go to the page where you describe the time of day where the, where the analysis was performed? Okay, so I just want to make sure I understand this clearly. The traffic counts were exclusively constrained to the times that you listed here. Anything beyond that, 6.02 on a Thursday, that's not considered. In this analysis, no, we did our counts from, from seven to nine and two to six. One of the things that the council has asked us to do and um, just approve that uh, extra Tuesday night, so I haven't had time between Tuesday night and now to do that work, 
was to extend the evening peak hour to 8 o'clock to look and make sure that the peak really is encompassed in this. And I will say that that's something I requested, not the council. See, we're on because the same Because I think page. the timing, to your point, 7 to 9, you're counting schools, but from 2 to 6, no one's off work at 2 o'clock. Right. So I think that really needs to be more around 3, 3.30 to 7.30, 8 o'clock. Because when you count the trains coming in right. after 6 o'clock, I mean, there's a whole bunch of trains up until 7.30 that are not included in this, which goes to the point very, very beginning of this is, I think, great work that Joe, you did, but it's not really reflective of the important times that really when this traffic is, is deep. So good question, David. We agree on something. There we go. Let's see if we can get some more. And I'll so just, here, if I can just add to, sorry to interrupt, wait. David. Sorry to interrupt for a second. Um, yeah. It is about thinking about the behaviors of the of the use cases, right? That the use cases at the site derive, right? So if you're talking about 375 residential units, we have no idea how many people. I mean, we have predictive models: how many people are going to take the train, how many people are going to be driving. But the reason to go after 6 p.m. is because anybody who works on some corporate campus somewhere driving back to Montclair, you're probably not getting back to Montclair before 6 p.m. And to David's point, and we agreed on doing this, was if you have a train coming in after 6 p.m., which you do, I live by Walnut Street, and Ben comes home on that train, right? It, it gridlocks the whole area when the trains, when both crossings go down on Grove Street and on Walnut. Um, so bringing that additional data in is something that we paid for on Tuesday night's Tuesday. council meeting that is going to affect this model, and it is why we're calling this a preliminary so I'd like to add another time zone, um, Saturday, Friday and Saturday evenings, because you have a unique traffic pattern that takes place when people are coming in for movies and restaurants, where you have a lot of people who are not focusing on a throughput, they're focusing on parking. So what's happening is you're getting people circling around, and that creates a whole unique traffic pattern where you, their behavior is entirely different from somebody going from point A to point B through. And so how do we account for that kind of unique behavior and at those particular times? So we can, of course, do other time periods and counts. When we put our cameras out, we let them run for the whole day. We let them run all, all the way overnight, quite honestly, just in case we needed the day to process the data later. Um, but what we're doing here is to sort of look at, we're layering on to figure out a worst case. So we're looking at for residential developments, the most traffic occurs during the morning rush hour when everyone's going to work and the evening peak hour when everyone's coming home. So if we're looking at 10 o'clock on a Friday night when the- 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. You know, where during those times, this development may not be generating as much traffic as it is at rush hour. Now, as you said, we are going to look at the to the eight o'clock time period. Um, there becomes a point where we have to look at how much analysis do we want to do in order to get to a result. And we could be running 24 different hourly models, and it just adds to the time it takes and the well, expense. But I I would like to just add another thing um, in terms of the traffic count study, and that is the dates uh, at which time you did the counts. So you're talking about January 5th and January 7th. Um, I would suggest that's probably the least traffic time of the year. Um, you talk about coming into June, May, April, where you have people coming out of the woodworks to come out and enjoy all the wonderful amenities and, and features that Montclair has to offer at people from out of town, they're not coming out January 5th and January 7th. So these traffic studies, all the ones that you say are now at C and D and E, those are going to go way beyond F. We're going to be at Z. So I just well, want to make it clear, just for everybody to recognize that the study is done at the least traffic time of the year. Okay? But David, and you're making it seem like that was an intentional no i'm not win. i'm not at all okay. but but if we're going to make decisions based on this we have to recognize that that is a, a statistically an inappropriate reference point for us to make intelligent decisions well yeah and i will say that the timing of the counts was really dictated by the schedule given to me we were told to start work on around january 2nd 
and the report needed to be done by the end of January, not, not, I very well couldn't do counts in June. Not and pointing that, fingers. And, we have. We can wait, come back to you, wait. Dave. You asked two questions. Let's. We have other people over here. Okay. Just a, a quick question. Um, I uh, kind of had issue, as I said in my questions to you, with the uh, codes that you were using. You had a code um, use L use. It's on, it's on there if you want to find it. How you describe the features of the? Um, the oh, I think no, no. Keep going. Nope. Keep going. I guess it's in here. Uh, no. Nope. Oh well, well. In your actual traffic study, you have codes L U C two two O. Right. Well, we okay, used. Well, let's talk about the um, the two two O. You're calling that dwelling units multifamily. That's described in that manual as um, low rise, two to one to two stories. That's not what this development is. This goes up to eight stories, and some two eight story buildings in height. Not a one, it's not a low rise. And there's two other categories. One is a mid rise category and a high rise category. So I don't understand that. So the other, and just to continue with the codes, the other one is the supermarket. You don't have, supermarkets have a separate code, but you don't code them separately here. You throw them into like a shopping mall. Right. If I can take those one at a time. Um, Two, land use 220, you're right, is low rise, 221 is mid rise, and 222 is high rise. And if you look at the actual data associated with them, the, high, the larger the building, the higher the building, the number of trips generated by it actually goes down on a per unit basis. So, why? If you have more units, why would the number well, of trips go down? Well, it's not the same number of units in a 10-story building ends up generating less trips than that number of units at two stories or three stories. I didn't make up, I didn't generate the data, that's what the numbers show. But you show. won't have the same number of units in a two-story dwelling as you will in an eight-story dwelling. Yeah. Well, Realist, so. Realistically, so I think we need to, so, let's not, I mean, we're not playing get, you know, get you here. No. But I think your point that you mentioned is whether or not you're trying to say two stories does not is not an adequate based on what we are looking at in terms but, of the size. Well, I'm looking at this and it's like you're not the initial data is not it doesn't seem correct in the categorization. This is not is I mean I don't know you're the expert and he's I'm actually saying though, that it's, it's actually it's handicapped though. It's actually more conservative because yeah, the numbers are higher using this approach. Yeah. Because That's I what just, I'm trying to say yeah. is that because we don't have a definitive plan with the no showing exactly how many, you know, how the units are configured, we opted to pick go on the more conservative side and use a lower, the two t land use 220 ends up generating more trips per apartment than say a high, than a high rise building. Now in real, you understand that 100 apartments at a two story would be on a much larger area but if you run, if you look at the same, you enter 100 units of residential into low rise housing and 100 units of residential into high rise, the low rise unit generates more traffic. What about mid rise? Because I think this actually falls in the mid rise. And mid rise falls in between. The higher the building goes, the number of cars per apartment goes down. So we went, opted for a more conservative approach mm, more aggressive the approach for people without cars and no david but it's the behavior but it's the behavior of the residents it's 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 completely esoteric but if you have somebody if you have a person on a higher floor in a building they're less likely to leave to go out to get food or run an errand than somebody on a lower floor in a lower floor and development who has the quicker access to a car. Walking outside of your single family house to your car in your garage or in your driveway, if you were debating going to Walmart or not or Target or not, 
you are going to be a little bit more likely to get your car and go if you have a, if you're closer to it <laughs> than if you're in a high-rise building. Well, you're more likely to order DoorDash or Grubhub. It's a completely esoteric conversation. Hold on, we have a but let's. And my point on all of this is we opted for the more conservative approach and looked for using of those residential categories the ones that generated the most traffic per unit. Next question. Uh, hi, um, hi. My name's uh, Layla Meher. I live at One Clover Hill Place. If you know where that is, it's right across from this. It's on the corner of Glen Ridge and Clover Hill. Um, a couple things. The dates. If you go back, you don't have to go back to the, to the dates. I know it was January fifth and January seventh. And when we were at that meeting a while ago, David, remember I had asked, "Are the, is this going to be done over the holidays?" And I work in higher education, so in my mind, the holidays is when <laughs> is higher ed not functioning. And I drive into the city, to the university I work at every day. I've been working there 20 years, and it is exponentially less traffic during winter break. And this was done during winter break, yeah, yeah. and it was done January 7th, for all those who don't know, is also a holiday of Orthodox Christmas, which most people are not aware of. But so I think, and the fifth and sixth, so I think that was the reason for my question. This is a really, uh, let's say, it's not accurate. It can't be accurate at all for, to have done. And I understand you said you were just doing it the dates you were given. So I understand that completely. Right. I'm, I'm just well, making it clear the that. Well, the issue was I, have a I had a start date. And no, a, I understand. This is when you need the report done. And the data collection is the first step. So um, I need to do, that was what we had to do to meet the deadline I would yeah, no, I told so I get I it. Given. Not you. It's not on you. I'm just I just want ever to make this point that and we're surrounded by colleges and universities and all of this. So to do it during winter break it makes uh, not much oh, sense. Oh, you mean to college me. winter break? Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, higher ed is school. out. Even schools was back in place when we did this. Yeah, they were back, but colleges and universities are all closed during this time. Colleges, so, yeah, December fifteenth to January fifteenth. Basically, we're closed. Yep, yep. At so, Montclair State, at least. Yeah, and where I'm at, it's the same. There, that's the winter break for all mm. higher ed. So I think this is a problem. The other one more thing I want to say is, um, you know, outside of the technicalities of the report, because of where I live, I am hearing the traffic on Glen Ridge. Like, even when I sit in my living room, you know, you can hear cars passing all the time. I am completely flummoxed at how anyone thinks that this is not to you again i know you just did the study but how anyone thinks that you're going to add 1200 people to this little location and it's not going to completely affect the traffic in the town when i drive to work every morning now i when i um i have trouble getting out of my driveway i'm not saying don't do this because i can't get out of my driveway i'm just telling you that it's a busy street and when I do go to the um, four-way stop on Claremont, it's been backed up since the stoplight was put, uh, the stop sign. I'm so glad the stop sign is there, though, because I know it's there for safety. But even that little thing made a huge difference. Um, so, I, and I know that I, on Grove Street, it's, it's really busy. Bloomfield is super busy. So I'm just not understanding how this is at all a reality. It could be. Um, I, I just have to say in support of the concern about secondary roads. Oh, my name is Bonnie Fogel. Um, I live on Forest Street right off Glenridge Avenue. And right now I have three neighbors that are looking to leave. Because we cannot get out of our driveway because of all the yo-yos turning. And, and plenty of them drive up the one-way street in the morning. I see this regularly. But we have such an increase of traffic on Forest Street that it's almost unsafe to get out of your driveway. So there are three people. They're going to keep the apartments and rent them. But the renting is a big problem because there's a tremendous turnover so for quality of life. The, the secondary streets are very, very, very important. It really screws up the quality of life 
to increase the traffic tremendously on them. And that has to be a major concern. The other thing is, I, I just have to say this as somebody who's you know, spent their life working in, in, in pr primarily in, in healthcare, but in other fields. If somebody told, came into my office, I worked in dentistry for many decades, and said, I, I need to get this crown and bridge work done in two weeks, and it has to get done now. And I knew that I couldn't do a proper job in two weeks. I would let them know that I couldn't do that, rather than you know, compromising my integrity. So if you knew the timing was not going to be good, it shouldn't have been done then, because the product is no good. And it's like, it's, it's like I think we wasted our money, because I know this is a partially done study, but there's a lot of it that just doesn't work. You know, but I know you're, you want to please, I know you do a lot of work for, for Montclair, and you want to keep your job, but you know, if somebody's asking you to do a job and you're not going to be able to do it well, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, one concern that I have is the parking along North Willow is only on one side of the street. In your facts for existing, it states it's on both sides of the street. And also, I've measured South Willow Street. It's only 26 feet wide, not 32. So I don't know if that affects your numbers with moving traffic through, but there's inconsistencies in some of the existing data that I've seen in your report. And I would like to mention to the council members that it would be appreciated to expand this traffic study. If you could go up Union Street to Fullerton, similar to the way Claremont does, and uh, Glen Ridge to the north to the further west terminus where people will make their turn to go around the traffic on Bloomfield Avenue. Thank you. Okay. okay, so with that being said, when when will the next uh, study be done, and will that be a combination? of both studies so you know you don't have two different parts that you're trying to put together and figure out what you're doing here. And then second, uh, is this uh, presentation going to be on the website uh, for review? I mean, I've got the, the original study, but the summarized version today is, is something I like to see. And then my last question, I promise I'll give you the mic back. My original question, <laughs> okay, from a, a modeling standpoint, because you said you do have some capability of doing some modeling based on percentages. I really would like to see some scenarios with that modeling in the next version of the, the traffic uh, presentation. So as far as I think the first question was, once, as I said, we were just authorized to extend the peak hours Tuesday night, so when we issue an update, we'll issue an updated report that includes that additional time frame as well as comments that we rec we've received from the town of changes or revisions if there's an issue with the um, descriptions of the existing conditions we'll take we'll take a look at that and make those corrections as necessary I believe this the second question which was would this presentation would be available I'm sure it will I think this is being recorded and streamed on YouTube so this whole evening is available and Janice I imagine you'll be able to put the presentation up on the website if it are, isn't already. I'll post it tomorrow. Um, I, would, I would, this is before my question, I would go so far as to say it probably doesn't even make sense for you to continue this study until we get to May because nothing that you take is statistically appropriate to measure the bottlenecks, the maximum bottlenecks, and I would imagine the county would have records of highest density of traffic by seasonality, and I think you need to focus in on what is historically the most seasonally intense traffic flow. So to do the study this time of the year, and you gotta remember too, we're still coming out of COVID. A lot of people's behaviors aren't necessarily the same that as prior to COVID and may not be the same further along post-COVID. So I just think that any further work on your part tying into traffic counts <coughs> would be a waste of time. That's my point. Uh, the second thing I want to say is you used the statistical measure of average to measure delay. 
to anyone who knows Montclair Public Schools, we're not necessarily ranked as high as Milburn and other schools in the state of New Jersey, and yet we have some exceptional uh, academic programs in our high school. But because everybody is measured on a base of averages, we don't stack up because there's a wide dispersion of population and, and, and performance, whereas a town like Milburn, of course, is a, a more homogeneous community and has, it has known for its school system, it's self-perpetuating, et cetera. But the point is, that's based on averages. And we all know Montclair gives a, a kid a very good, solid education, as David Cummings can attest. So what I'd like to say is, um, the use of the t of statistical use of averages is really not the best statistic. I would suggest mean as a mechanism to measure what would be the more typical experience of delay. Is it possible for you to use a mean calculation? So we're using commercially available software programs, commercially um, industry accepted methodologies that are used for all traffic studies, all si signal analysis throughout the country. There, we would have to write custom write software specific to that condition, which was well beyond the scope of anything we were asked to do. Can I just say something, because I'm gonna be leaving. You're doing a great job under the conditions that we put you into, okay? And I'd like to know if um, the request to go to May. <laughs> well, here's what I'm concerned about. The people on Clover Hill, see, there's 50 families on Clover Hill who are going to be jammed up with this if we don't do this right. And if we don't do the analysis at the time that the professor, my fellow professor, if, if that's what you do at the no, college, or oh, your dean, it's even bigger. but. No. It, these things, but if you you were making a point, and Mr. Carter's making a point, how do we protect these residents if the study is not timely? If it's not timely, if it's right. not in the right time? Well, I want to be very careful. This is not just about Clover Hill. Right. We have an entire area that will be impacted. Clover Hill just happens to be a very uh, strong group that is there, but we have folks. We haven't even, like I said, we haven't gone to Elm Street yet. And there are residents who live there. So I think, Bob, to your point, yes, we are going to know what Clover Hill wants. They're, they're there. But there are other residents, like the folks who live on Grove Street in those apartment buildings. They are just hearing this. And my, the issue I have there is where are their friends going to park if we turn this into complete lanes? There's nowhere for them to park. Where are they going to park? They're going to park on Grove Terrace. Or they're going to park on Clover Hill. Because to imagine, to expect people to walk to a parking lot, you know, it's, that's when you get into quality of life. And so I think that's the part that concerns me most is eliminating that parking on there. There's a whole bunch of two and three family houses there, as well as two huge apartment buildings. And I think it's just, it's just a, a, it just shows to Mr. Scott, there's a very good question that you asked. We really need to look at, you know, at what point do we not have so much impact on the streets? But that's another conversation. I'm sorry I took up. Uh, I just okay. want to say, Somebody. David, I just want to say, obviously, I'm not looking at one street, but that one street is where the people are going to be cutting through for traffic and speeding very, very seriously. And, and it's going to be, you know, bad impact on all the streets in the area, from Glenridge Avenue, Pine, everything. So... I have to leave, but I just wanted to say that I'm trying to hear you. We all hear you, and I just wish we could have more time to do a better survey. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to um, ask, please, the council members, when you um, do the next study, would you please consider doing the study in the morning, um, perhaps extending it to at least 930, because the retail and stores and that, many of them don't even open until 930. And so if we're shutting it off, before 9.30, you know, people, when they have more retail in there, we're not even considering that. So would you please consider having him extend it beyond the hours that he's doing there? The other thing, sir, when you do the next um, rendition, would you please uh, write out what the acronyms stand for so that people are um, aware of that when you have your little, you know, the acronyms in there? That would be helpful. Of course. That's, we're, 
interesting. Trying to compress a lot of data into a small amount of time. And but we final thing that, that I wanted quicker. to say quickly was that, um, yes, we do have to consider all the residents. I certainly understand Clover Hill is in a unique position, but we have schools on the other side that are in extremely uh, difficult situations. On Washington, on Fulton, we have the child care, Montclair Child Development Center, and all of those. So I want all of the streets to be considered um, equally and uh, understand the uniqueness of all of them. Because right now it takes two traffic lights to go across the Bloomfield Avenue on Elm without the additional traffic. Um, I just, I'm yeah, Clover Hill. I just want to say I support everyone outside of Clover Hill because, you know, it's going to affect all of us. But um, yeah, so we're with you. Um, did you say this thing ended at 6 p.m.? Was that when the timing? Seven? seven? No. No, not this, the, the study. Yeah, was two, the to six. two to we six. We, can't, we recorded, we processed the video and got traffic for albums between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. So, uh, I think it, it should go longer because anyone who drives into the city, I mean, I don't think it's like a lot I'm, of people. I'm sorry to cut you off, but we talked about this about 15 oh, minutes did? ago. Yeah, we are. It is extended. We are. And we already paid for the extension. Oh, till uh, what yeah. time? Uh, did we do till 7 or did we do later than 7? It was the or process that counts till 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Oh, great. Okay, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was just approved by the council Tuesday night, so oh, I just didn't have time. I no, no, no problem. Thank you. I yet. missed the beginning and I couldn't find the link to stream. So. Um, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was Mr. Cummings who just recently said that it was a very good point to see at what point the, um, the who was? Mr. Oh, no, Scott. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. not going to take his At what thunder. point, you know, we, the, the number of people or units works and, um, I, I think I came to 16 different meetings. Right? I was only here a couple of years, like in 2017, and I, when, when Pinnacle was trying to develop this, and I remember I went to like every planning board meeting. I mean, there was so much hard work and research that got done, and so many changes and amendments. And it was thoughtful and well-researched, and I remember they started out at three-something, and they got down to like 158, and it wasn't, they didn't pull that number out of their heads. That was a number that, that had a lot of research and background and consideration. So are we like considering that all that work that went on and that the hardworking people did is BS? It seems to me like we sort of have an answer already. I respected the process that went on then. I thought it was wonderful. It was difficult, it was disgusting. There were people that were bad players, but I think that number means something. I, I can just clarify where we are. That was a site plan application. That site plan was approved. Yeah. There was litigation, yeah. which precluded it from being developed. Then the property was sold, so we have a new property owner. And this is the direction that the new property owner has chosen to go in. Rather than, might I suggest, rather we have Joe here. Working with the This township. is supposed to be traffic circulation. So. Instead of getting into the bigger issues, let's try and answer the questions that right. folks have for Joe. Is there anybody else who I, I missed? Okay. Hi again. Um, so just to make sure I understand, can you please identify which intersections on Bloomfield Avenue that you measure traffic on? throughput, uh, et cetera, and so, which cross streets? So we looked at Grove, Lackawanna Plaza, and Willow. Those were the three signals on Bloomfield Avenue we were tasked with. So you did not include Forest, Midland, Park, North and South Fullerton, and Park Street? No. Or not, not Forest, but um, Glen, yeah. So, so Park was not considered, the Fullertons weren't considered, uh, Midland, and I guess that's it. So, no, they weren't. Those were the only three intersections but we looked at that would, I said. Wouldn't it be important to understand Park Street in particular, but also North and South Fullerton, which in and of itself is a, a very complex intersection, as I'm sure you know. 
Don't those have to be considered? You have a tremendous amount of density in terms of retail and restaurant traffic. The core downtown commercial district at present, the center really is between, well, effectively Midland and South Fullerton and North Fullerton, and yet they're not even considered in this. And you're gonna have stacking, again, you're talking January, when you get to May, you're gonna have stacking all the way up. As you can imagine, Willow to Lackawanna Plaza, you're talking about maybe 15, 20 yards where you're gonna have stacking. But now, I, and I can tell you from personal experience, my driving down Bloomfield Avenue to go to a, if I want to attend an event at the Wellmont, I drive down Bloomfield Avenue, it takes me forever, I can't find a parking spot, I go home and then I take an Uber. But the point I'm getting at is, there's already incredible stacking taking place all the way up Bloomfield Avenue, and yet the analysis doesn't even take into that into account. Can you comment on that? So, as you could imagine, we were given a request for proposals to count this many inter these intersections at these times with, under these configurations, and we had to respond to that request. If I it, basically were, for lack of a more diplomatic way of putting it, we're performing the analysis we were asked to. I'm sure the, the council members that are here hear your concerns, and that's something they can consider. I can't just unilaterally say, I'm going to study 87 intersection, so here's a bill for a million dollars. I have to work within the confines that the town has asked me for. So I think they hear what you're saying, and that, that's a decision that the council has to make the decision of whether to spend the money on the analysis, not me. But Joe, one of the things I think you could, if you could just, because we did have these conversations, you, you, the counselor, and I sat and we talked with Janice and we talked about how far out to go and where do things stop to, you know, start to not make sense anymore because you can't predict it with your model because you don't know. And it was something about if a car is passing some X number of streets or intersections, you don't even know if that car is going to make it to that intersection because they may have already turned off to go somewhere else. I just remember you saying something along those lines. Like, there's only, it's only, it, it gets worse and gets less predictive and accurate the further you get away. Well, and the further you get away from the site, that traffic tends to spread out more. Right. And the impact that these models can measure is only so much. If you're adding one, only adding one car to the intersection, the change in delay that this model spits out isn't going to tell you anything because you might see uh, it go from 37.1 to 37.15 and that's not really significant to make a decision on. I mean, I did, as you remember, I did provide Janice with a, a supplemental scope that added what I thought were the appropriate intersections and I think that's something that's still being considered. So I have given my recommendations, but I need to do right. the assignments that I'm tasked with. Okay, so, so I have a question. It seems to me at the site there's two particular pinch points. One being where the entrance is to the supermarket parking deck on Glenridge Avenue. You have trucks going in there, you have cars going in there, and coming, both trucks and cars coming in and out. You have a very active post office. Now we have this bike lane for, that goes nowhere. I, I'd like you to comment on, have you looked at the effect of traffic on that, in that particular area? And the other area, I didn't realize this, but on the Lackawanna Plaza Avenue, is it correct that there's four lanes going and coming into the deck there? You said two full movement lanes. So that would be four lanes that, that go into Lackawanna, uh, Go into the parking deck from Lackawanna Plaza Crane. No. Well, what's a full move, movement um, lane? A, a full movement driveway or full yeah, movement driveway. intersection would be would allow you to make left turns in and left left and right turns in and left and right turns out. That doesn't. Oh, that's mean what that, full movement means. Yeah, that yeah. doesn't mean that the, each each one has their own lane. You may be able, you know, in a smaller intersection. You may make the left turn a left turn or a right turn from the through lane and coming out there may the lefts and rights would share the same lane so the number of movements does not directly correlate to the number of lanes so how many lanes are there that go into the glenridge avenue entrance to the parking deck and the lackawanna avenue we'll call it avenue 
to the parking deck. So at this point, we assumed, and I'm going off of memory, that they were single lane approaches. For both directions, single yes, lane, so both that directions. One lane in each direction, and, and one lane on on the driveway or the side street, and you know, one coming going into the development and one coming, coming out. out. And we truck, oh, sorry. So as far as trucks and whether or not the truck needs a wider lane to swing the turn, that amount of detail we did not get into. That's something that would be worked out during a formal site plan when but, your local, when the rest of the buildings and everything else are located. But it's part of the traffic impact on Glen Ridge Avenue. If you're getting trucks that need a wide angle to turn in there, and you have post office traffic and you have other traffic, how can you not look at that and make some kind of judgment or observation about whether that would be successful or not? The whole point of this is making the supermarket successful. And if there's problems with traffic entering and, it and leaving, that strikes me so as a problem. So we're, we ac we're accounting for large vehicles or heavy vehicles. That is accounted for in the analysis. I That's saw that. one yeah. of the parameters. Mm -hmm that we factor in and look at. Um, the, the simulation models look at heavy vehicles as a percentage of the total traffic stream. So that is embedded into the models. We enter those percentages and look at those values in the, in the models. I didn't go into that right. uh, amount of detail in this presentation, but, but as but far as whether it's a 30-foot radius curve or a 60-foot radius curve turning in, that kind of detail, exactly how the trucks would maneuver in and out, that's something that wouldn't get Not part of a traffic study for you. That yeah, would yeah. get handled in site plan because mm -hmm. right now I don't know exactly where those driveways even are. We just have approximate locations. Yeah. Yes, it's a single lane in each direction. So while, while we're in the same area, please, I'd like to ask um, the council members, if you can please um, help him to understand that we have a national monument in this same area in the Crane Park. And when we're talking about the traffic and that type of thing, um, please consider that and treat it as we do other monuments of uh, national recognition because of the work of the council and Jose and the Northeast Earth Coalition. And I would like for us to um, maintain parking accessibility in the same type of considerations that we would for anything else of this magnitude. So while we're trying to shuffle the traffic here and there, I think um, because Montclair is just blessed to have Crane Park there, we shouldn't just have four and five and six lanes of traffic, you know, maybe a bike lane here or there, but things that are going to be uh, very safe for children and for buses that are going to come and, and have tours in that area. So, and this, this level of study is to give us that first cut of where do we need an extra lane. It doesn't necessarily, and the concept plans are to put some, some pictures to it to help everyone understand what it could look like. That doesn't mean it has to look exactly the way I have it shown on the concept plan. Um, it's the first step of telling you where you need more lanes. Exactly where those lanes go is something that's figured out later on in final design. So that, you know, for example, on Grove Street, another possibility to get that left turn lane and save the parking may be to widen into the properties. I've, we didn't show that, but those are other possibilities, or instead of at Grove and Glenridge, instead of widening all the way to one side, that can be shifted and widened on both sides. That's something that would typically be handled in site plan, and as the plans are further along, and things like making sure that when the trucks or the cars need to swing the turns, they, stay, they, re they respect the parking around the park and other things, that's details that would have to be worked out 
in site plan when we figure out exactly where everything goes. Excuse me for one moment. We have a, we do have 27 people on the live stream. So I just want to acknowledge the folks watching at home and remind them, and maybe you can just go to that last slide again, um, for, for Janice's contact information. And then of course, if you go to the Montclair Township website, you can also reach out to any of your council members, including myself and Councillor Cummings. So there's 27 people on that are not getting to ask their questions in real time because we don't have the technology in this room, unfortunately, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thanks. Um, so you should keep talking about these algorithms, these computer simulation software programs that you're plugging information in. Um, I know that, as an example, Lower Manhattan and Greenwich Village has a certain uh, irregularity of intersections, non-perpendicular, non-grid-like intersections, whereas you go up 40 blocks and you're on a grid and you have a much more rationalized flow and a much more rationalized, in terms of just thinking about the cognizance of the driver and having to be attuned to having to make either a 90 degree turn or an acute turn or an obtuse turn. This intersection and these area, this entire area, with a minor exception, has no 90 degree perpendicular intersections. To what extent do your algorithms and software take into account this unique uh, uh, um, dimension of traffic circulation. And again, most of this, I imagine, is human behavior and cognitive capacity to function in a more uh, uh, irregular environment. So could you comment on that? So our model, we're looking to use the base standard models. And there is, to my knowledge, this the synchro models, while we do input the the network as it's shown on the road we basically bring an aerial photograph into the model and trace over the roads to set our network the capacity analysis that we're using do, is not granular enough to change say the difference between a 90 degree angle and a 60 degree angle the analysis looks at the amount of time a uh, signal a green time a particular movement gives the volume, the width of the road, but the, the details of exactly what angle the road is, the software that we're using, the level of service analysis, is not that granular. As an expert traffic circulation professional, how would you address qualitatively the degree of variance that one should account for for this irregularity of plan, of, of intersection? Forget the algorithm. How would this, you're asked, you're sitting out at a bar, you're drinking a beer, and I ask you this question. How would you respond to that variance of completely a different environment than a grid? So what I think where things are getting off topic is the, this, these models and this study was meant to answer the question of what is the impact of this development on the network. So we're looking at the change in conditions by adding the traffic of that development. We're not looking at the absolute, well, this should be, okay, because of the angle, it's not a 26 second delay, it might be a 28 second delay. We're looking at the delta, the change between one condition and the next. So we're trying to hold as many other variables constant as we can and focus on this is what we're changing and look at the impact. Otherwise, we've, we go down a theoretical rabbit hole that we never and never get the answer to the question we're looking for. So this model is focused on <coughs> trying to hold as much constant as we can and look at the impact specifically of if you add this development to this roadway, what will happen? And I just have another question. Uh, from a council standpoint, I mean, you've already approved a, an additional study, but do you have flexibility uh, within a, a financial range to add more items to that study before it's undertaken? So, you know, you don't have to keep going back and back and back at that point. And then just one other comment. If I was at a bar with David Kurtz, I'd find that a good thing. <laughs> I'm just glad we're having the second study, Mr. Scott, because the original plan was to accept this one. 
So I think we've, you have the two counselors who've probably been paying the most attention to this. We did, we meet with, with Joe, and I think we have to figure out um, how do we, like my, my question was, I felt we needed to give more of Walnut Street because it goes to side streets. You're talking about Greenwood Avenue, um, Willow Street, Green, no, before even I'm just talking when Walnut Street and Claremont run the same way. So those those that traffic going around, you know, similar to what the folks from Clover Hill are worried about it. Well, I think you explained it well with Forest Street with the change on the one way, you now have streets coming. Well, you once you impact this, you're gonna have cars going not just from Willow to not just from Glenridge and Willow to Claremont, they're gonna go all the way to Walnut. So and those are, again similar streets. So I think that's the first area that we're looking at and again and then going over to elm street again to union i mean elm street to hawthorne and elmwood avenue so i think as that's an expansion that we have the the question of going up to the way as as joe explained we did talk about do we need to go all the way up to to fulton or do we need it and it's like no because you know we want to stay to the most area impacted because the numbers do show that once you go further away it's, it could be coming from David. I didn't speak while you were talking, so I think it's very important that you understand that we're looking at this and we're taking it into consideration. I think, from me, I do think this shows that there is an impact, and so therefore, it does require some more conversations. And then the other part, and Janice after the conversation, the developer needs to know about this because he needs to see. You're talking about replacing traffic lights, and you know I think that is something that should not be coming on the township, especially if it's the cause is because of the development. So there are a lot of things that still have to go. And as Janice has said many times, we haven't even got to site plan, you know, where the re more questions are coming up. And But to your question about the uh, the brook, you know, I did meet with our engineer, Steve and, and um, Gary, last week. You know, so there's a lot of things that are still happening that the council is trying to do to make sure that whatever we – finalize is something that represents the community and also the good work that our professionals are trying to do i just have to i do have to run because i have a board meeting across town i just want to conclude uh, in terms of my comments and thoughts it's this just continues to be a process and what i care about is the integrity of the information and the value of the information that we're getting this costs money. Every hour that they do work for us costs money. And we don't get that money back unless there's a redevelopment plan approved, right? So we have to be mindful right. of, of how much it costs, all the things that we'd like to add on to it. And we have to make those decisions. And for me, it's about the reliability of the data, how long, you know, how, how, how much you can rely on it, the accuracy as you get sort of further and further away from the, the epicenter uh, where this is developed. Um, and also just a, a strong sense that you know, we're not going to, there's, there's what's going to happen anyway in a trajectory of growth for the town. And there's the problems that exist to, already exist today, like stacking of cars on Grove Street, already exists right now. Um, and so we have an obligation too to discern and be careful about discerning what are the problems today that have to be solved, what are the problems that would exist with a no build that we would have to solve anyway with the county, and then what are the problems that are gonna be created that are net in addition to those things as a result of building a project there. And then those are the things that you have the conversation with the developer about paying for as part of the redevelopment plan agreement. So I wanna thank everybody for participating. As you all know, because you message me on everywhere you possibly can, I'm available and I respond. So please reach out to me if you have additional questions. Thank you. And the one thing I wanna add with that is what we typically see when we do these studies, DOT has a definitive process for it is what they call fair share. It's usually not cut and dry as in the case here where the developer comes in and they're, they're causing the whole problem. There's usually a problem there and that the development is making that problem worse. And it's not a cut and dry, okay, well you dropped one more car, you have to pay mm -hmm. half a million dollars for a new light. There's a fair share consideration well part of that's the responsibility of the town that's traffic's already there part of it's the responsibility of the developer and what we see on a lot of these projects is we look for the developer to focus their efforts on certain key locations that it doesn't do the town 
or anyone any good to get 4% of a traffic light over here, 8% of an all-way stop over there, that they look to aggregate their, their improvements to one or two locations where it would have the most impact instead of just getting a portion. You can't build half a traffic light. So you'd rather have the developer build instead of having a responsibility of a quarter of the improvements at say five locations you have them build one or two locations and get that improvement and then as the town has the resources maybe they tackle a different intersection so <laughs> i i had um one more question or consideration that you might not have realized was coming back i heard that decamp was talking about running buses down Grove Street again. So I don't know if it would, that would have a big effect on making it so it's just one through lane and a left turn lane, if cars would just be going around the bus into the left-hand turn lane, or if something else might be able to be done about that. Um, I didn't mention my name before, I'm Andrew O'Toole. I live at the corner of Union and South Willow Street. So I'm very knowledgeable out there, and I'm also a PLA. OK. okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. And uh, I will be posting uh, this uh, uh, presentation uh, on the township's website. Okay? Yeah, Janice. And make sure it's, it's this one because with the green, the colors and everything, yeah, that's, yeah, that's very good. I have it. All right. Just so this is, that's the same file that I gave.